Good morning and welcome to the next and latest episode of Barclay Damon's Labor and Employment Podcast. My name is Lee Jacobs, a partner in the Labor and Employment Group, and I'm pleased to be here with my co-host, co-partner, co-friend, co-everything, <laughs> general great person, Rosemary. Good morning, Rosemary. Wow, with an intro like that, my gosh. <laughs> morning, Lee. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. And I'm looking forward to this conversation um, that we're about to have today. We are, this is a, uh, a hot off the press episode for, for you viewers out, listeners out there. Um, because I don't know about you, Rosemary, I've been getting a lot of questions about these new exemptions overtime rules. W what are you even hearing from our clients and listeners? Well, it, it, that's exactly right, Lee. I had a call just yesterday. One of my clients called and they said to me, so Rosemary, why didn't you tell me about these new overtime rules? And I said, uh, you know, I'm not sure what you're talking about. What do you mean? Well, the new overtime rules. And so as we, as I dug a little deeper, I realized, oh no, it's, it's confusion around the salary threshold and pay frequency. Don't worry, listeners, we're going to explain all of that. But, but it was just, everybody just has seen these headlines, right? Or they get these alerts from you know an HR company that they work with or something that says, hey, get ready for these over changes to overtime, and they think there's some big change. So it's exactly what, I, I mean, two or three calls a week, Lee, for the past few weeks. I, I couldn't agree more, and, I'm, and, yeah. and I've been getting the same thing too. They said, well, Lee, didn't you do with Rosemary this episode months ago where you said, here are the new rules, and I, I followed those rules, and now I'm getting these blasts, and I'm freaking out. And yeah. And, and as we're about to tell you, take a deep breath. It's going to be okay because essentially, if you're following New York law already, you will be in compliance with these new rules that are coming to place from the federal from the federal government. But, but don't tell them that, Lee. Then they won't listen to us. Well, I think well, because there are some catches to it, though, right? There are. That's right. Always, I'm, I'm yanking your chain. I'm yeah, yanking your chain. As, as always, there's a catch. But I, yes. I, I think I think it's it's probably good to start. You know, as we spoke about before, some a little bit of foundation to understand why this confusion, why these questions are coming into place. Yeah. So, but, but before please. you do that, Lee, fun facts. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Fun facts. Um, if, if do you mind if I if I can just steal a little thunder of my fun fact that my my bit my big fun fact was last week or was my grandmother's one hundred and second birthday and I got to celebrate it with her and I couldn't have been happier and I look forward to celebrating with her her hundred and third and fourth because this woman is like the Energizer Bunny she yeah. does not stop so that's my fun fact of the day and a very happy and loving fun fact. That is a wonderful, happy birthday to grandma. That is awesome. That is awesome. Well, you know, my, I don't know that I'd call it a fun fact, Lee, but it's definitely a fact. So for our, for our listeners who have, you know, seen me on, on screen before, you may notice a few little marks here along the side of my face and that thinking, what the heck happened to Rosemary? Well, here's the fact. Um, I spend a lot of time in the sun, Lee. <laughs> so I am now paying the price. So I was at the dermatologist last week and, uh, you know, they fr had to do a lot of, uh, you know, freezing off of uh, precancerous. So my public service announcement for all of our listeners, wear sunscreen. You know, and the irony is I was on vacation in Mexico, of all places. So everybody somehow thinks, well, that's what happens when you go to Mexico. I said, no, it was not that fast. <laughs> this has been this has been, you know, brewing for a while. But anyway, that's why you see the marks wear sunscreen. So I remember growing up, my mother, my grandmother's daughter um, would sit by the pool with uh, baby oil, with iodine, with one of those visors, with the, with the aluminum foils. And as a kid, I was like, that looks terrible. Now as an adult, I'm like, oh, please, I want to do that. But hearing your story, I'm like, mm, maybe not. Maybe and can not. I just say, I think that, um, you know, I must have gotten that from your mother because that is exactly what I did. That's what you do. We're in Buffalo as soon as, and I'm, I love Buffalo, not dissing the weather, but, but that the minute the sun was out, I had my iodine with my baby oil lathered up and the, the, the tin foil laying out there. Oh, yeah. And like I said, paying the price. 
I may be doing that this weekend down here in the city if the sun is out. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. You <laughs> You'll see me a That's Monday. Right. I'm bright red, Rosemary. That's right. That's right. So anyway, all right. So now we got to get down to the serious back, stuff. Back, back to, right. to the federalism discussion to take us yeah. back to high school, right? Right. So the federal government sets the floor, the bare minimum with the Fair Labor Standards Act, and states and cities can come in and set the ceiling with higher rules, higher minimums um, under, and in New York, that's the New York labor law. So just very briefly, this is the, the best way I think to think about that. In New York City, minimum wage is $16 per hour in, uh, in Long Island and Westchester. Everywhere else in New York, it's $15 an hour. But in Tennessee, in Kansas, in Wyoming, in Idaho, Minimum wage is still the same rate that it was when I worked as a shoe salesman in high school in the 90s, $7.25 an hour. So while the federal government says $7.25, states and cities can come in and do a higher rate. And that's what the confusion is coming from here, because New York set its new rules for exemption thresholds, and we'll define those in a second, at the beginning of the year. And that's why you had all the announcements from us and all of our what, and earlier podcasts. And then fast forward to a couple months ago, the federal government has now upped, not minimum wage, but has upped the exemption thresholds. And so that's where this confusion is coming from. And the exemption thresholds, and, and I hate lawyers when we get so specific with these words that really don't make sense. So it's really when we say exempt, it means you are exempt from pay, being paid overtime. So if you are non, if you are presumed to be under the law, whether it's the FLSA or the labor law, to be eligible for overtime pres presumptively. And then you become ineligible for overtime when you meet two main characteristics. First, you have you do a job that makes you ineligible for overtime and you make a certain amount of money that makes you ineligible for overtime. If either of those characteristics are not met, you get overtime, regardless of how much you make or what you do. Did, did, I, did I put that in a good way, Rosemary, or do you have in a real life example or something to help crystallize that perhaps? Yeah, well, you know, um, that's exactly how I'd say it. And the only thing is, and I didn't want to interrupt you, Lee, is at the beginning, you know, uh, as y'all were sitting there listening, you may have heard Lee say New York State changed its rules on thresholds. And I would respectfully suggest, Lee, that we don't even use the word rule because I think it's just throw. That's what I think is throwing people off. If you think okay. about it, they think a rule is like we think of something being written down and you've got to follow it. So so I I like to just say, you know what? The salary thresholds have increased. So just like minimum wage is increasing, the salary threshold for an exemption has increased in lockstep. And in fact, if you were to go and read, don't do it, everybody. It's boring as heck. But if you were to read the New York labor law, it actually tells you with the, 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 uh, um, the percentages, right? So minimum wage and then the, the salary threshold for the exemptions um, goes up by a percentage based on what the minimum wage is and the percentage there. So again, don't get into all, you know, none of that matters because they'll just tell you what the numbers are. But, but just think of it as the threshold is going up as the minimum wage is going up. And, you know, and the examples, you know, it's, it's Lee just said, Rosemary, give us an example, um, uh, you know, to help crystallize this literally happened last week client called me and asked about the new overtime rules and so reminded them talked them through everything and they and what what they meant by what the what this rules question that's been coming up so we talked about the salary threshold and her response was great we're all set then because we're paying everybody at this that the threshold all right and i said all right and they happened to just during that conversation make reference to the job title. They said, yeah, so we're going to pay all of our, um, in this case, I'm trying to remember what the job title was. Um, uh, I, think physical, I think it was physical therapist. I think it was physical therapist. And, um, and as she was talking and she said physical therapist, I said, wait a second. I said, so 
tell me what these physical therapists do. And so she started to describe what they were doing. And I said, wait a second. I said, I, you know, I'm not certain that you're, they're going to meet the duties test. And her response was, but we're paying them a salary and it's this amount, Rosemary, it's well over what New York state wants. And I said, but again, we've got to look at what their duties are. And so we went through that and I gave her, so every, uh, if you don't know this gang, go ahead, you can very quickly and easily Google FLSA exemption, job duties, and, and they, the um, federal government, the Department of Labor has put out terrific fact sheets that explain all of the duties that are required. And they talk about a primary duty. And as we went through it, none of them were meeting that. And, I and think she's also building on that. I think the, the, the DOL defense had even a wizard where you can go in and click and answer mm -hmm. questions and it will help yeah. you. And we'll, we'll put a link up onto the, our Spotify page and other resources for everyone to be able to yeah. access um, yeah. those materials. Yeah. But um, what they call, if I could just say, and, and you know, what I always say is, as Lee, you, you know, he already described this or explained it, but just think of it as there's three tests and they have to meet all three tests. It's just that simple. Do you pay them a salary? Is the salary high enough? And are they performing the duties? It's just that simple. And if one of those three is missing, they're not exempt. Yep. I, I think that that's, and, and I think that is 150% correct. And I, I'm thinking of my own personal life history. I remember, and this, and this is in context of also this change of the threshold number. So I remember when I was in high school, my, I may have been the shoe salesman, but I had friends that were working at McDonald's. Everyone was an assistant manager. Mm -hmm. They called everyone an assistant manager to avoid paying overtime. Mm -hmm. And then when enforcement came through and looking in to see what they were actually doing, you could call them manager, president, CEO, cook, for, whatever you wanted. It does not matter what the title is. You got to look to see what they exactly do. Um, Can I tell you, I have to interrupt you, Lee. That literally happened yesterday. Still I was on the phone. Happening. Literally, what you just described happened yesterday. I was on the phone with the U.S. Department of Labor um, because they're they're doing it. Um, it's not as a result of a complaint. It's just a, a you know one of their random investigations. And they said, you know, and I don't want to say anything um, because it's active right now. But they said, you know, I'm looking at. Um, this, uh, um, these payroll records and they've got like basically every single person, not every single person, but you know, half of the people are managers. And she said, which means I can see that none of them are getting overtime and they can't possibly given this industry. And I, again, I don't want to disclose anything. She said, that's not possible. And I just listened because of course, and, and, and then we, I had a conversation with the client and lo and behold, they weren't looking. Now, they were not looking to do anything intentionally. But but again, it was the same thing. All these men, well, they're a manager. Bring them in. They're a manager. They don't get overtime. So and I think so. I think let's do you think I think probably best to start with the different uh, exemption categories and yeah. then move to what the amounts are. I so, agree. So yeah. so, you, so these are the duties and responsibilities, your title, everything that relates to that. You must hit all of these elements in order to essentially move to the next test, which is, do we pay you a salary and then do we pay you enough? So one of the one of them is an executive exemption administration, administrative exemption. So I, I, I in, in New York and these come from the Federal Labor Standards Act and the New York labor law adopts most, if not all of these same rules. So I like to think of the first one, the executive, the managerial exemption. This is what we generally and colloquially think as someone who is a manager, they're running an, a division of an enterprise, they're in charge of people, they're scheduling, they're in charge of firing, discipline. They are traditionally what we think as a manager. But yep. when you dive a little bit deeper into the, the code and you see what the requirements are, in New York, in order to be a manager, you have to manage at least two people. If you don't manage at least two people, you manage one person or zero people and your title is manager, guess what? You're not a manager. And during the pandemic, this hit for a number of my clients in a very real life scenario. Restaurants that were here in the city, and I'm sure across throughout the state, laid off vast numbers of their staff 
And wound up, what wound up happening was the people that they retained that were working were their chefs and managers, their exempt employees that were used to, before the pandemic, manage kitchens, manage fronts of the houses. Now all of their staff have been sent home and have been laid off or they're on PPP leave, whatever it is, they're not there. Even though they are a manager and we're paying them enough, and we'll get to you what the enough is in a second, they were no longer managers under the law. And if there was an audit or a lawsuit, we would have to be paying them overtime now for these 80, 90 hours per week that they were working. Um, luckily, no one got dinged on that. But that was something that in addition to all the things that could keep me up at night during the pandemic, that was one that uh, was it was bright, and, uh, bright there, but no one actually got dinged for it. Um, hey, and Lee, do me a favor, just for everybody, repeat that, not the whole thing, but what you just said about the two, because I think that's really important for people to, to understand. A, yeah. To be a manager, New York considers you to have to manage at least two people. That doesn't mean like you're their mentor or you say hi and you check in on them in the morning. Right. That means you have functional power over them. It's either mm -hmm. you're part of the hiring, firing, discipline decision, mm -hmm. uh, promotions uh, choices. You're in charge of scheduling. Um, yep. A good word that I like to use is that when you put all of that together is you control the financial destiny of somebody else. That's right. It's terms and conditions. Yeah. Terms and conditions of employment, Lee, right? You you control their terms and conditions of employment. Yep. And that's yep. and that's the and, and, and that's the managerial e executive exemption, as I see it. Yeah. Um, and then there's the administrative exemption. So this is, you know, uh, when I speak about this in the open world with people, you know, and they say, oh, the admin exemption. So that means my administrators, my administrative <laughs> staff, my, my, my legal secretaries, my, the secretaries, they, we don't, I don't have to pay them overtime. You do. Um, it, it depends, again, not what the title is of what exactly you do within that exemption. Uh, Rosemary, do you have thoughts on the admin as I, because I, I always, again, say the practice of law is open book as I flip to what exactly the admin exemption requires. Do you yeah. have any, um, any real life examples of how you've seen someone using the admin exemption going wrong or awry? Well, it was it was the exact what you just said, Lee. Wow. So it was, well, our, our person who sits out at the front desk and wel welcomes everybody, their job title is admin. So uh, they, they're entitled to that exemption or they're covered by that exemption. So I think, you know what I think it is, Lee? I think it is the, the name of the exemption, right? Because, I mean, it, it really is executive to me is so it's, it's a manager, as we said. But when you think of executive, you think of manager. But administrative, it does, it does bring up the idea that, oh, this is someone who is an admin. But... It is so much more than that. And, you know, Lee's looking up right now so he can tell you exactly. But um, again, use the fact sheets that are out there. But, you know, the, they'll talk about the fact sheets will talk about the primary duty and that, you know, so and he'll discuss that in a minute. But it's also that these individuals are exercising independent judgment. So if you think about it, not at all taking away Lee from someone who is, is a legal secretary or an admin or the person who's sitting at the desk, you know, nothing to, again, um, uh, uh, no commentary on that position. But what I will say is if the individuals are not exercising independent judgment about things of significance to the business, all right. So that, that's that's really what they're looking for with that. And when you step step back and start to think about that, OK, is this person actually exercising independent judgment about things of significance to the business and performing the duties with Leo C will or will um, share with you in a minute? Then very quickly you see, oh, no, it's not the legal secretary. It's not the the uh, the individuals who are working in the mail room who we call admins. Um, you know, and and I have to say, it's also a lot of times, you know, somebody will say, oh, well, what about the executive assistant, Lee? Mm -hmm. Well, again, probably yeah. not. Probably not. So go ahead, Lee, share with them because I know you're looking at it. I, I got to say, Rosemary, you 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 hit exactly what the point is. <laughs> exactly. 
and, and the one that I want to is it says so the so under the from the from one of the wage orders specifically I'm looking here at the hospitality wage order of New York which is the same in the miscellaneous industry and the same from the FLSA from the federal government the administrative one is and I'm reading quote here whose primary duty consists of the performance of oh. office or non manual field work so you got to be in an office, not in the field. Again, titles are irrelevant here. Work directly related, related to management policies or general operations of the employer. B, and Rosemary, this is where you get the gold star of the day, who customarily and regularly exercises discretion and independent judgment. That is, that's the key thing here. Um, and, and you could, and I'm not going to belabor the point, Rosemary, because you got it exactly right. And the third and the third element is who regularly and directly assists an employer in a bona fide executive or administrative capacity who performs own, under only general supervision work along specialized or technical lines requiring specialized training, experience or knowledge. So yeah. I like to think of this perhaps this would be maybe like a pharmacy technician. Right. Someone who is yeah. shows up, they come to work and they have they exercise their own independent judgment on how to do it. They have general supervision by yeah. the overarching pharmacist of telling them here, you know, do the work. But the pharmacist isn't micromanaging them. They're their yeah. boss. Yes, yeah. so I don't. Oh, sorry, Lee. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, please no. Please take it away. No, I was going to say also, you know, if you I, I will sometimes look and say, you know what, let's see what your people in accounting you know, so some of your, you, you know, your, um, you know, uh, the, the individuals who are sitting doing all of the, um, you know, managing all of the books and that. And so um, something like that, you yeah. know, I, I yeah. think and I, I think that is a exactly on point. And yeah. so the so the, the there's three three main exemptions, executive, administrative and then professional professional. And professional was the one, if you remember from our prior episode when we talked about this, is where we said there was the catch. The catch here was is because New York, prior to the federal updates, right? New York for the executive and the administrative exemption, prior to the, uh, stand, excuse me, from 2023 going into 2024, the amounts that needed to be paid to these people to qualify under these exemptions were if you were in New York City, Long Island or Westchester, $1,200 per week or $62,400 per year. And everywhere else in the state, it was $1,124.20 per week or $58,458.40 per year. Why the government couldn't just done $1,125 per week and made it $58,500 per week, I don't know, because that's what it used to be in New York City two years ago, but yeah. who knows, yeah. right? So those were what we were talking about, right? So to be a manager and to be exempt from overtime, you had to be a manager managing two people, New York City making $62,400 on a salary on a regular basis, mazel tov, don't have to pay overtime. But the professional exemption was the one where we gave you a catch last time. And the professional exemption, the reason why the catch exists is because New York did not come in and set a ceiling as to the amount of what must be paid in order for someone to fall out of, the, uh, of overtime. We followed what the federal government had said previously. So before we talk about the money, what you must pay your professionals, let's talk about what a professional is. Under the law, a professional is someone who has a uh, requires knowledge of an advanced type of a field in science or learning customarily acquired by a prolonged course of specialized intellectual instruction and study as distinguished from a general academic education, from an apprenticeship, and from the training and the performance of routine, mental, manual, or physical processes. Hmm, Rosemary, <laughs> I don't know. Who do you, what kind of profession do you think applies there? I don't know, maybe. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe me and you. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyers. Lawyers, yeah. accountants, doctors, doctors, things to that nature. And then CPAs. And then, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And then 
And then when you move away from the schooling, right, you need the degree. It's perhaps, you know, a creative individuals, artists, chefs, things to that nature that are working in a professional capacity, something that you need more than just your life experience, so to speak, in order to accomplish and meet those goals. And again, and again, Rosemary, one last thing, uh, the, an important thing here is that, again, you must have uh, independence. You must have the ability to exercise your own discretion and judgment in what you do. Yeah. And you know what I was going to say, um, Lee, is, you know, you went through that such a mouthful, you know, with the, for the professional and the education. So some additional points to keep in mind. Um, generally, generally, um, having years of experience. So I can't tell you how many clients have said, well, they've been doing this job for us for 10 years, for 15 years. That I mean, doesn't that count for something? No. Right? Exactly. No, it does not. So that doesn't. And then the other is I've had people say, well, so-and-so, we the job requires a BA in this or a master's in that. All right. Well, the BA, unfortunately, not dissing any of us who got, you know, a, a Bachelor of Arts out there. But no, you heard what Lee said, general education. Right. Um, but so so let's put that aside. So that, you, you know, you that just doesn't count um, or it won't be enough, I should say. But what I will hear, as I just was started to say, is my clients will say or an employer will say, well, the job description requires a master's in X. And so then I will often ask the question, all right, well, so Lee is in that position. Does Lee have a master's? Well, no, he doesn't. But he's got the experience and the skill and, and we require it. I mean, the job, doesn't that count? No. So as Lee said before, and we will say it over and over and over again, it doesn't matter what the job uh, post said. It doesn't matter what the job description says. What matters is, you know, what that person is doing. All right. What are their actual duties? Because let's be honest, we're all guilty of this. You have a job description. I got one. I was responding to a charge. I said, send me a copy of the job description. Literally the date on the description on the job description, the creation date was 2012. Hmm. Right. So again, you know, it's just we, we, all of us fall into that trap. You think, oh, you know, the job description, it's fine. It kind of gives a basic framework. Again, that's why it doesn't matter. All right. So if, if the DOL comes a knocking, they're not going to say, hand me the job description. They're going to say, let me talk to Lee and Rosemary and Kyla and Ari and everybody else. And let me ask and understand what they're actually doing. All right. And we're also going to talk to Lee. So Lee, tell us, what is your background? And Lee's not going to say, he, he says, well, I don't have a master's. Okay, and well, there you go. The there. master's disappears. That's right. Exactly. So. And, and then and then it doesn't also matter if, if you have, if I, so for example, I take my JD and now I go and work and want to be a pastry chef, for example. Great point, Lee. Great point. Yes. Not going to work. Yep. Your degree, the advanced degree that you have has to be towards the profession that you're working for. That's so, right. So there are in my, a lot of my clients, you know, are for some reason, there are a lot of reformed lawyers who wind up going into hospitality and become chefs <laughs> and things to that nature. Yeah. So you can only be a chef that's exempt from overtime and fall in the professional exemption if you have a degree from a culinary school. It does not matter that you have a BA or an MA from Cornell's hospitality program. No, it's if you're a chef, you need a degree from a culinary school, for example. So again, the government being, whether you're being audited a private lawsuit, does not matter whether McDonald's calls you an assistant manager, whether you do this or, you, or whether your job description says that, what will matter is what reality is. Mm -hmm. And so we'll find out what that reality is. And if you're not following these guidelines, um, you could face potential penalties. So these EAP exemptions, okay? So we talked about that. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Executive 
administrative professional because somebody may be listening, Lee, and think, EAP, did I miss something? <laughs> yeah, no, I, yes, executive administrative <laughs> professional, EAP. Yeah. So yeah. for the E and the A, right? It, we know what New York's numbers are. Again, 58,500, 58, a little bit less. If Everywhere but New York City, Long Island, and Westchester, 62,400. For the professional, New York does not have a number or a threshold, and it adopts the federal number. So previously, before these changes are going to come into effect from the federal government, and here's what you've probably all been waiting for, and we've kept you at your seats for about a half hour, so drum roll, please. <laughs> so as of July 1st, and that's if these rules do come into effect, as of July 1st, these exemption thresholds are rising from $684 per week to $844 per week. So for the E and the A, the executive and the administrative, which apply here in New York, if you were following and listening to what Rosemary and I said to you four months ago, you're good because you're already paying well above what the federal government requires. And if the professional exemption, you were relying on that and you were paying someone $684 per week previously and relying on the professional exemption, yes, you do have to move that person up to $844 per week. But I have a good faith belief, Rosemary, that in New York State, very rarely, if at all, can we find anyone who's a professional that was making $684 per week today <laughs> that a business think, has to be worried about. Yeah, I, 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 have, I have to agree with you on that, um, Lee. And uh, the, the other thing I would add to this is, so I want to make two points. So the first is this, this is um, what Lee just talked about with that increase at the federal level for the P, the professional. That I think, or we think is one of the reasons people have been coming to us saying, we need that, what are the new rules? What are the new rules? There's something else which we'll talk about in a minute or two. So that's the first thing. But the second thing I wanna say is Lee just said, you have to move them up. So, so, as we discussed four months ago, you have to move them up to that number if you want to claim the exemption. Remember, Lee started out saying, what does exempt mean? Okay, you are exempt from the minimum wage requirements, the overtime requirements. All right, so um, specifically the overtime requirements. So if you have someone, because I work with a not, lot of not-for-profits, Lee, and they'll say, Rosemary, we don't know if we can afford that. And what I've said is, okay, well, what you have to do is do an analysis of the business and in particular, the individuals who are actually performing those duties. All right. And look and see, you know what? Um, and, and I'll be curious to see, um, Lee, your thoughts on this. But what I'll say to them is look and see. And a lot of these not-for-profits, people are scheduled 40 hours a week. But because of the meal period, which Lee and I talked about, everybody gets a 30 minute uninterrupted meal period. Um, it actually turns out to be 37.5 hours every single week. So they rarely, if ever, even come close to the 40 um, <clears throat> or, you know, they might creep up to 38 or 39, but they're not, they're not going to hit over. They're not going to work over 40 hours. So it may make sense for you. If you're sitting there and you look and you say, you know what? Our people come in at nine, they leave at five or they leave at four for 30. You know what? We don't have to worry about overtime and it may make sense for you financially. Again, because I work with a lot of not-for-profits to we're just going to leave it at 684. So again, to be clear, it's not like all of a sudden because the federal government that, that has raised their floor, all right, that you then have to because you're in violation. No. It's only if you want to claim the exemption. Thoughts on that, Lee? I think that that's right. Um, and, and I've had conversely, right, where I've had clients that said to me, I've got my managers. I can't afford going them up to now $62,000 here in New York. What should I do? I said, well, still call them your manager, convert them to an hourly rate, pay mm -hmm. them an hourly rate, track their hours, and you pay them overtime when you go over 40 uh, 40 hours per week. 
And if you do the math, do some forecasting and some modelings, you might wind up with some savings if you figure out that this, these people, as you said, Rosemary, don't work any overtime or very little overtime. Conversely, if you have an employee that you know is working 20, 30, 40 hours of overtime per week, you must raise this up because what the government will do is convert them back to an hourly employee and then give them overtime in the way that is the most non-beneficial to you <laughs> and the amounts of money that you will have to be paid to your employees will be astronomically higher than what it would have been if you would have just paid them the threshold. So right. it, it, it's, it's one of these things here that you've got to look at your business model, look at what you can afford, and then make an informed decision knowing that, okay, I can't afford overtime, convert them to hourly, tell them that they're going to, that we're going to pay them overtime, but you must get your overtime pre-approved, et cetera, et cetera. Someone works overtime, you pay them for their overtime and you write them up, right? For not getting it pre-approved. And that's how you, there are, for better or worse, there are solutions to all these problems. And that's why we hope you're listening to us, continue to listening to us and continue to reach back and ask us questions for feedback and, and, and more information. And, and what, yeah, please, Rosemary, it looks like you're about yeah. to say something. Yeah, no, I was going to say is, you know, Lee, um, you know, we've had them sitting, you know, listening to us for, it looks, appears to be almost 36 minutes. I wonder if we should maybe take a break and, uh, um, you do know, part two? do a part two. I think we might need a part two here. What do you think? I think that's a great idea. So I think what I think for the part two, so stay tuned, everyone. The part two of what's coming up, we're going to, we'll discuss something called a highly compensated employee, that this is a, a, a topic that has come up from both a number of my clients. I'm curious, Rosemary, if you've had that come up, as well as I want to hit on what you talked about, um, because if, if the, the attuned listener may have heard I said two things, it makes you exempt. And Rosemary, you, you said three. Your three was a regular salary that meets yeah. the certain amount and the duties of the duty. So I want to talk about the regular salary aspect, because that is something where people try to, how do I put this? Bite away at the edges and try to try to try to make someone exempt at a later point. So stay tuned um, and we'll be back with part two. The Labor and Employment Podcast is available on BarkleyDamon.com, YouTube, and all your favorite podcast streaming platforms. Like, follow, share, and continue to listen. Thanks.